Professor uh, Chancel, first of all, thanks for, uh, for joining me here in the, in the chair. I will start by discussing the very premise for your report. Greenhouse gases are global in the nature. It doesn't really matter where and by whom they are emitted. And we're, such, we're in such a hurry. In that perspective, how does it really make sense to quantify inequalities in carbon emissions or even spend time discussing inequalities in carbon emissions? You know, the, the, one of the basic founding principles of the climate negotiations and, and of our coordinated movement to try to solve the problem is really the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so it's not sufficient to have a broad conceptual uh, phrase here. We need to, to understand what this means. We need to better measure, better track these common but differentiated responsibilities, I think, to better act upon them. Um, uh, one one of the reasons for that is to, to make sure that we are directing our efforts in the right place. So we all need to act wherever we are in the world, but some need to reduce their emissions faster than others. Some need to put more efforts into that. And this is one of the reasons why we want to better monitor this inequality. The second reason really is that um, we want to make sure that the policies we implement are not hitting uh, uh, those who might emit little and who might have little capacity to mm -hmm. act. And so there is also uh, uh, um, an, an efficiency uh, issue here at stake because if we are uh, targeting all the policy efforts, if we're demanding all the efforts on people who in fact are not emitting that much and have little capacities to act, this may lead also to social unrest. This is what we've seen in some rich countries over the past few years where policy measures such as carbon taxes, for instance, were targeting groups of the population that didn't have that much high levels of emissions and that were very much constrained into their ability to change, to transform their lifestyles. I'm thinking about the Yellow Vest movement mm -hmm. that happened in France, for instance, a few years back, and that spread to some other European countries to some extent. So this is another reason why we need better measures, although, indeed, everybody is in this together. Mm. So this isn't, first and foremost, uh, a moral issue for you. It's about efficiency, right? I think it's a, it's a basic you know, policy evaluation issue that, that we have. And then everybody can, you know, deal with the moral question uh, how, how, how they want. But from the policy point of view, there's a clear case to be made that we need more of these indicators. Mm. Most economists talk a lot about efficiency, uh, and you as well. Uh, but, but when traditional economists uh, discuss, uh, discuss efficiency when, when regarding... Uh, climate mitigation, they tend to point, point towards mechanisms like, like emission trading schemes because they are considered to be the most efficient way to reduce uh, emissions. And what those, uh, those uh, mechanisms have in common is that we don't need in any information about the distribution of, of emissions. They just ensure that, uh, that reductions can be realized at the lowest possible cost. Isn't that a rational approach? Well, you know, have we been fast enough in our actions against climate change over the past 30 years? Uh, I think we'll agree that we were not fast Maybe not. enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it because we didn't do enough of these schemes? Some people might argue that, you know, uh, we would solve the problem with a global carbon tax and, you know, then let's sit down and just, as economists, and just wait for things to unfold. You don't believe in the global carbon tax? You know, I, right? I think, you know, it's carbon taxes are necessary uh, part of the solution, but they are not the only part of the solution. And when they are thought without factoring in inequality, mm. they can actually uh, lead to um, resentment against uh, these policies. This mm. is very much what we, we've seen in, in, in several countries. Like and your country. Uh, li li like France. And, you know, in fact, th these movements, you've, you've seen them in other parts of the world as well. Um, late 2019, several protests over the world, and some of them were associated with uh, the, the rise in energy prices. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is why, for instance, the US um, over uh, the summer passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, 
mm. which is a bad name for a climate policy because this is largely about a climate policy. Mm. In it, there is no carbon tax because they also knew that uh, uh, carbon taxation might not be the, the only way to move forward mm. and to take into account these inequality aspects. Now, maybe let me say one final thing on carbon taxes. Please do. <laughs> uh, there are many ways, in fact, to develop carbon uh, policies. In Canada, for instance, when the carbon tax was implemented in British Columbia, it was associated with a rebate given to low and middle income households. Mm -hmm. Basically, the money raised by the carbon tax was re-injected in the economy precisely for low and middle income group. And this made it possible to buy the political support of these groups, which was not the case in France, for instance. So we see again that it's key to factor in inequality and we cannot just say, okay, let's put a carbon tax and things will work out smoothly. Mm. Let's leave the, the carbon tax at least for a while. It's a very interesting topic, but uh, maybe we'll come back to it. You, you find that, that not, not only emissions, but also the consequences of climate uh, change are unevenly distributed. To, to quote your, your report, you write that studies point to a strong socio-economic rela relationship between exposure and current living conditions, whereby the worst off are more affected than the rest. So uh, when the top emitters are likely to be protected, from, from the consequences of climate change. Do you believe that this affects their incentives to reduce emissions? Maybe a leading question, but... <laughs> right. Um, yeah, maybe the, yeah, the answer is, uh, is in, uh, <laughs> definitely the, <laughs> the formulation. <laughs> you may uh, elaborate a little. <laughs> <laughs> and so here again, uh, common but differentiated uh, responsibilities on the one side, and then common but differentiated impacts. Mm. Uh, so, so we're all facing impacts of climate change, mm. but clearly those impacts, and that was very clear in the, some of the graphs that were presented just before, are, are starker uh, at the bottom of the, of the, of the social scale mm. for several reasons. Uh, first, there is often more exposure to risks. Mm. So for instance, when we think about uh, land markets or housing markets, often uh, the, the homes, uh, that are more exposed to risks, river floods, for instance, are the least costly because of real estate markets. So that's where low-income groups are going to live. And so there's more exposure to uh, the possibility of a flood. But then on top of that, there is also more vulnerability when the shock, in that case, the river flood, may uh, hit a population. So not only low-income groups are more affected, but also they have less capacity to be resilient because the materials of their homes might be in, uh, in, in, uh, not as strong, not as solid of higher income groups. Is that a surprising finding? So, so this is a very well established uh, finding. This is uh, indeed not um, a surprising uh, uh, element of the research. That being said, uh, maybe the novelty here is that these inequalities are not just in low income countries, it's also in high-income countries as well. Mm. Uh, we've seen that over the past summer and over the past two years in the heart of Europe, mm. where uh, uh, climate shocks also have differentiated impacts across the population. And this I think- It's not just a global south issue. It's not just a global south. Everything that we've been talking about today is in fact, all the messages uh, 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 apply to the global north versus global south discussion and within the global north and within the global south discussion as well because you also have uh, you know, high polluting groups in emerging countries as well mm. that are well protected from climate troubles. Mm. Uh, and they also have part of the finance, part of the capital to start to act and that are, are not asked to contribute enough. Mm. To, to continue to, to talk about surprises, one of your most surprising findings, at least, uh, at least uh, for me, is that overall inequality in global emissions is now mostly driven by within-country inequalities. Is that something new? It, it, it is to the extent that in, 19, in the early 1990s, when the conferences of party cycles began, it was the reverse. Mm. It was the reverse. It was really a, a north-south issue. Um, and at that time, so it made a lot of sense to, to frame our understanding of the problem and of the solutions in, in, in this framing. Today, and, that, and that framing is still very dominant, right? This framing is still very dominant. 
And it, it is true that there are still very big and stark north and south differences. Mm. What we're saying is that on top of these huge inequalities of emissions between countries, you get to. we also have huge inequalities in emissions within countries. And so this calls for uh, um, uh, you know, an updating of our framework to address these issues. Mm. Mm. You point towards a very strong link between income consumption and emissions uh, and to do just you know touch upon methodology issues the, there is an ongoing debate academic debate on how to measure carbon footprints uh, and in the report you admit that there are some i will not say say weaknesses but maybe challenges also in the approach that that you have taken and without going into detail we don't have time for detail uh, could you say something ab about your, your confidence? How, how confident are you about your findings? Sure. So let me first say one of the conclusion, repeat one of the conclusions mm -hmm. of the report. We're still collectively uh, relatively bad mm. at measuring these emissions. And when I say collectively, I'm also thinking about governments and statistical institutions mm -hmm. who should be the primary actors in publishing these statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can do much better. So this means putting more efforts, more finance into making sure that governments, statistical institutions publish these numbers themselves. You actually point towards more statistics as part of the solution. It's, it's a, I, I like that. a not sufficient <laughs> but necessary yeah. condition for it. Now, as researchers, we try to provide estimates, numbers to fill a gap. There's a big data gap. And we're pretty clear about the fact that these numbers are far from perfect. Mm. We think that they are much better than nothing at all. Mm. Uh, we're very confident about the global numbers we present. Because these global numbers, as Philippe Botta was uh, presenting, uh, there's an emerging consensus about these numbers. So basically the stock global inequality, top 10%, about half of the total, bottom 50%, from 10 to 15% of the total. Different methodologies, different approaches between different research groups come to the same results and conclusion. Mm. So, confidence about that. Now there's a specific question about emissions at the top of the top of the top. Mm. There's no big surprise. No matter how you're going to measure that, they'll still be pretty big. <laughs> uh, that said, we can discuss about different ways to look at the problem. And I think, you know, this is why it's important to have collective approaches among statisticians, among researchers, to move forward on these issues. Mm, but you are confident about the big picture that you Absolutely. present. Yeah, yeah that's, that's nice to know. Um, I, I used to be a politician. Don't hold it against me, but that's, uh, that's, the, that's the sad truth. <laughs> and, uh, and in my previous role as a politician, I, I often heard a claim that we will have to choose. We can limit global emissions, but at the cost of fighting poverty. But you are sort of claiming that uh, that this contradiction doesn't really exist. When it comes to extreme poverty reduction, the, the results from research are very clear on that, on that point. Now when it comes to making sure that it's not just about poverty reduction, it's about generating you know, a vast middle class in the emerging world. Uh, what we also want to show is that, um, well, uh, the development space for this to happen is also uh, a space that today is taken by the huge emissions of the top 10%. Mm. So this is where uh, the choice has to be made, but it's largely about what the top 10 decides to do or not to do to reduce their emissions. What they choose to do? What it chooses to do. Now, the, 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 the good and positive side is that we know the, the options. Mm. We know the technologies. We know the economics. What we don't have enough is the social and political, and since you were a politician, Will. the coalitions that support mm. these measures. And so far, we don't have the coalitions enough. Why? Because over the past decades, I think we've, we've been in a world where we thought that just telling the science was sufficient. Mm. Saying, okay, we should act would be sufficient. Mm. Now we know it's not sufficient enough. And I think we need to look a little more about who's gaining, who's winning, what might be the potential conflicts at stake in, mm. in this transition? Mm. So we're back to the inequality discussion. Yes, and this takes us directly to the policy implications of your findings. So we, we need more money. 
a lot more money to finance mitigation and adaptation. And that's something we've heard multiple times before. Uh, for instance, when the Stern report was launched this fall. And that report takes a very practical approach, I would say. These are the investments that we need to make to reach the Paris targets, and this is how to do it. So we need financing partnerships, risk-sharing programs, uh, we, we need to, to resolve debt and liquidity issues, etc., etc. But the Stern report doesn't assume that we need a fun fundamental redistribution of wealth and a reform of both national and international tax systems. It seems that when you incorporate inequality in the assessment of climate change, it really, it fundamentally affects policy recommendations. It's, um, it's an opening of the policy space. Basically, it's, it's a, a widening of the policy toolkit. Mm. And, and, I mean, you know, to be fair, rich countries have been claiming that, you know, they would act on the uh, climate finance transfer side of the story for the past 15 years, this $100 billion uh, for adaptation mitigation in the global south, mm. uh, saying that this should be a floor. Mm. We're not even able to reach that floor by 2020 the date at which we're supposed to, to reach that. So, we need and so the that. idea is that uh, with new ideas, with new pr policy proposals, this makes it you know, more likely that we are able to actually reach this objective. Mm. But then we need to talk about feasibility of your recommendations. To target the bottom 90%, or at least the bottom 50%, you suggest uh, substantial use of public investments, subsidies, social protection programs, cash transfers, etc., and this should be financed with wealth or corporate taxes on the top 10%. Is it possible to tax the rich at such an extent that it makes a real difference for the bottom 90? So first things first, uh, let's look back at history. So basically when we developed social and welfare states in the global north, first part of the 20th century, uh, the basic political economic deal that happened was that more transfers for the bottom and also universal transfers, education and health, financed by more taxes at the top. So what you, what you see first part of the 20th century is really this steep rise in progressive taxation mm -hmm. to finance these universal transfers that were largely benefiting the bottom. So this is what happened during the, you know, the high growth phases in uh, the high income world. And so to some extent, the rise in welfare state systems in the global south uh, can also happen with this kind of political and economic uh, uh, dynamics. Um, now, what is pretty clear is that in, when we think about tax ca capacity in the global south, uh, there there's a lot of things that can be done. Mm. So taxes are often regressive in the sense that they rely essentially on consumption taxes, uh, no inheritance tax, uh, very little progressive taxation, little taxation of capital. Mm. And this, these are things that um, uh, we're not even trying to do them in so many countries. So the first thing would be to do that. The second really is about uh, the international and the global part of the picture and how utopian this is. Mm. I would just like to remind one basic fact. 10 years back, when colleagues of mine or myself were talking about a global multinational tax, people were telling us, you're utopian, right? Yeah, uh, I remember. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was told that too. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so we see that this deal actually was able to materialize. This deal is far from perfect, as I was trying to show, and the world will never be perfect. Mm. But we can make huge progress, and we've seen that in a few years, huge progress was made. So that's why I remain pretty optimistic about, you know, these proposals are not just ideas taken out of thin air. They can also materialize in practice. And by the way, back to the Inflation Reduction Act of the US. Mm. Uh, how is it financed? It's financed by new taxes on multinationals. Mm. on capital incomes, and it's explicitly presented as such by the Biden administration. Mm. So you have here, uh, you know, one way to do things. So there's the global north versus global south dimension of the equation that's missing, but we see that some policymakers are actually implementing climate policies financed by more taxes on the top of the distribution. Because in a world where, where capital is so concentrated, it makes a lot of sense from an economic, but also from a political point of view to do so. Mm. 
It's very relieving to hear that you are op optimistic regarding the, the international tax policy uh, uh, discussions, but, but you also advocate more progressive national tax regimes, more, more uh, taxation of capital, for instance. And, and some people would, would make the opposite argument, saying that we need to stimulate private ownership, investments, technological breakthroughs, uh, in, in order to stand a chance to, to meet the, the Paris Agreement. Are those people wrong? Leading question again. <laughs> well, you know, between 0% taxation on capital and 100% there's a wide range of options, mm -hmm. all right? And so I, I agree. we can all agree <laughs> that, that, that zero is pretty low, right? Uh, as it happens in many cases. Uh, then, for sure, private investments uh, are part of the equation. They mm -hmm. need to be there. Uh, and we need a massive re redirection of... Uh, uh, big share of private investments to the transition. At the same time, we also need to realize that um, um, private investments are, you know, often not so good at dealing with this issue of equality of access to infrastructures. Mm. And here, when we think about, for instance, transportation or energy infrastructure, the equity dimension, equality, inequality dimensions is, is important. And, and private investments can be the good way to do that. They are not always the good way to do that. So that's why governments have this huge role to play. And they have played this huge role over the past. And they will continue to play this huge role in the decades to come. Governments have a, have a great role to play. That's, uh, that's uh, the last we will hear from you now because our time is up. But I'm sure, sure the conversation is not over by this. Thanks a lot for your contribution, Thank Professor you so Chancel.